How many's got somebody lost in their family? Wave at me, wave at me, wave at me. Amen. Anybody close to the front? Here, here, brother. Here, brother. Take that right there. That'll, that'll be yours. Just keep it and, and, uh, and tell everybody so good about it and let them all buy one. Amen. I want you to look with me in your Bibles to the book of Ruth. I'm going to use several scriptures out of the book of Ruth. Brother Chris, last time I was here with you guys, a tragedy happened in your county. I think a lady backed over her child when I was, we were here, and, and we were down at the restaurant, and Brother Chris had to leave and go, go see about that family, and it was a, a, do what pastors do. And as we begin to talk in days after, we begin to talk about bad things happening to good people. And there's a message, and I want to share a little bit of my testimony and tie it in uh, with this message. There's a message that I preach called Handfuls on Purpose. And Brother, Brother Chris asked me, he said, I want you to come back to Grace Point and I want you to preach that message. And so, so we worked it out, and this was the date that we could, we could come. This message is going to do several things. Number one, if you're here hurting today, it's going to show you how God can bring you through some things that you never thought he could bring you through. Number two, he's going to show every one of us. Too many Christians think that they just get saved just to get a ticket to go to, go to heaven. And that's not what salvation is all about. We're supposed to be God's hands extended. Are you still with me? Amen. I, I told somebody the other day, well, I got saved to go to heaven. I said, well, God should have shot you the day you prayed. Amen. He should have just knocked you in the head and said, come on to heaven. That ain't the reason he saved you. He saved you so that you could be a presence here in this world that we're supposed to be his. When the world looks at us, remember when Jesus said, when you see me, you see the Father? That's what the church is supposed to be. When you look at the church, you see the Father. And there's things that God has instilled in you to do. There's things that God wants you to do to help somebody else's promise come to pass. So the message this morning has twofold. For hurting people, man, he's going to show you something. And everybody in here has been hurt or hurting or will be hurt in your lifetime. I'm going to ask you to lift your hand this way, and I want you to pray for me. But I want you to take the other hand that you got and lay it on your heart and say, God, speak to me today. Father, I love you. And God, I'm a Pentecostal preacher. I love to preach, God, when I'm spitting to the fifth pew and everybody's standing to their feet. But God, I also love to preach things that helps people get through stuff, that'll help people help somebody get through something. As the man so, so eloquently saying what a go, God, sometimes, sometimes I hurt. Sometimes I cry. And a lot of times us modern-day Christians feel, God, that we hear the strawberry shortcake message so much that we wonder if you're real whenever things ain't going the way the, way the TV preacher tells us it ought to go, the way the, 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 the shallow Christian tells us it is. We get, we get confused, and we wonder if you're really real. We wonder if we're really yours. And God, I pray today, that you not only speak to us directly because there's some hurting people here. God, as I begin to tell my story, I notice heads bowed and I notice tears starting to flow. There's some people that can relate to hurt. They know what it means, God. And Father, I pray that you speak directly, that you let this word do as it said in Psalms. You sent your word and healed them and delivered them from all of their destruction. But God, I also pray this word becomes an instructional tool, God, that you show us that you want to use us to help somebody, help somebody get back. In the lovely name of Jesus, I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Before I get started, look at your neighbor and say, he's prettier than Pastor Chris. Amen. Praise God. Amen. The, sto <laughs> the story of Ruth, what a powerful, powerful story. You would have thought Ruth had everything, not Ruth, Naomi is what the story is really about. You would have thought Naomi had everything under control. You would have thought Naomi, amen, was, was had the perfect perfect life. Shelly, do you mind helping me? I mean, you're already a preacher now, so come up here and help me just a second. Shelly, we're going to let you be Naomi. Naomi, you know what her name meant? Her name meant sweetness. Wow. So here we got Sister Sweetness, her name, Naomi. Here we got Sister Sweetness. She's married to an awesome guy. Is that your husband there? What's his name? Neil. Neil, come up here, Neil. She's married to an awesome guy, and his name is Ahimelech. Ahimelech, if you will. So this is Ahimelech. Now get, get this, here Sister Sweetness is, and she's married to a guy whose name means my God is King. Wow, here Sister, Sister Sweetness is married to my God is King. They live in a place called Bethlehem, Judah. 
Bethlehem means house of, house of bread. Judah means praise. They lived in a place called house of bread, amen, and praise. They lived in Bethlehem, Judah, sister sweetness, married to brother, my God is king, living in the place, leaders, if you will, in a place called house of bread and house of praise, amen. They had two sons. They had two sons, amen. I need me two young men, two young men. Brother, brother right there with your arms folded, would you help me? Brother right here with the glasses, I like your glasses. It makes us look good to wear glasses like that, amen, amen. She had two sons. Amen. Now, now this is where the family, and here they are living in a good place. Here they are married to, she's married to a good man. Her name, her mama made her sweetness. But then they had two boys. One of the boys' name was Chilion, and the other boy's name was Milion. Now, Chilion and Milion, this is what their names mean. They mean sick and sickly. Are you with me? Uh-oh. So even though Sister Sweetness was married to my God is King, living in a place called House of Bread and House of Praise, uh, she had some problems while she was living there. I don't care how good you are with God. I don't care how big you are in church. There's always going to be something in your life that keeps you humble. There's always going to be something in your life that makes you trust God. So here's Sister Sweetness, married to my God is King, got two boys named Chilion and Milion, or you will. I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing their, their names correct. Now, they, they, things turned kind of bad uh, in the house of bread. And things can, it was a famine, if you will, in the house of bread and the house of praise. So my God is King looked at his wife and said, let's go down to Egypt, and we'll just stay there a little while until, until it turns around. I know a lot of people, I've pastored a lot of people like that. They'll be involved in church and everything will be going good and then something go wrong. Well, we're just going to lay out of church a little while until things turn around. We're just going to go down to Egypt and hang out for a little while until, until God begins to turn things around here. We're not going to be a part of the turnaround. We're going to go away and wait till it turns around before we come back. So here they go. Here they go. Walk this away, if you will. They walk down to uh, Egypt. They go down into Egypt. Now, this is where the story gets kind of messed up because Sister Sweetness is there, and while she's down in Egypt, old brother, my God, is king. He dies. You can go sit down, brother, my God, is king. Amen. She loses the, the husband called my God is king. Uh, king and then her boys her boys amen they want to get married they want to get married and so they they come and they marry a girl named named ruth if you will amen one of them marries a girl named ruth and the other one marries a girl named orpah can i use you you, you don't mind amen and marries a girl named orpah so now now her family is here but but these girls are girls that she really didn't want them to marry these girls are moabite girls God's children ain't supposed to hang out with Moabites. Moabites, Moabites ain't even supposed to be here. Moabites was a product of incest, if you will. Remember the story and remember the story of Lot? Whenever God told Lot to get out of Sodom and Gomorrah, he told Lot to get out, don't even look back, and he took his two daughters and his wife, sister Lottie, I call her, and they started, uh, they started out on a journey to get out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember the story, and Sister Lottie turned around and looked back, and she was turned into a pillar of salt with those two daughters, amen, took their daddy up into a cave, the Bible says, and, 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 and got him drunk and slept with their daddy. One of them gave birth to the head of the Ammonites. The other one gave birth to the head of the Moabites. That's where the Moabite people come from. They come out of an act of incest and drunkenness in the family of Lot. And Sister Sweetness says, I don't want my boys to marry no woman down here. But how many of you know if you quit going to the church start hanging in the bar, your boy might marry somebody that you wish they hadn't married. Amen. So here they are. Here they are. My God is king is dead. Here they are still down in Egypt. They were just going to stay a little while. But he, and then what happened? Sick and sickly got worse and worse because both of them died. Oh, my goodness. Sickly died and then sick died. Her problem that she had when she was in church got worse when they got out of church. The problem that they had when they were in the will of God got worse. Now, I ain't going to tell you if you come. You know, I get aggravated with these, with these TBN preachers, and I, I don't never talk about preachers, especially when you got a point up, but I get aggravated with these TBN preachers that it's all about, about money and blessings. If you send me $100, if you send a gift of $58, God will bless you with a new car. Amen. And, and people sent their $58. Now, I don't believe 
believe that. If you believe that, then we'll try it out today. Give me $100. We'll see if you'll get a new car. Amen. Praise God. But, but listen, I have paid my tithe and then wonder where my light bill money is going to come from. Amen. There's going to be times that I don't care who you are. There's going to be times that you're going to, that you're going to have. But if you get out of the will of God, the problem you had in the church will get worse when you're outside the will of God. So here Sister Sweetness is. Here Sister Sweetness is, and she's got two daughter-in-laws. One is named Orpah, and one is named Ruth, and this is all she's got left. Then she heard there was a revival back in Bethlehem, Judah. She heard about the revival. And so she said, I'm going to go back to back, back home again. I'm going to go back to Bethlehem, Judah. And she told these two women, these two girls, Ruth and Orpah, she said, listen, I'm going to go back. Y'all just stay here. And she went to explaining herself. She said, she said, now, now the, the story was if you married somebody, like if, if, if I, Debbie's married to me, if Chris was my brother, if Debbie's married to me, if I was to die, then she would have to marry Chris. You would have to marry the brother. That's how it went. And Naomi told the two girls, I ain't got no more sons. And I'm old. And even if I found a man now and, and had another son, you girls ain't going to wait till he gets old enough to get married. Y'all stay here, and I'm going to go back to Bethlehem, Judah. And both the women said, no, we're going to stay. We're going to stay here with you until Naomi, Sister Sweetness, and I hope I'm not confusing you, Sister Sweetness explained the condition. Listen, y'all going to want to get married. You can't marry nobody unless he's my boy, and it's going to be a long time for I have a boy. If, I, if possible, I'm gonna, I have one, but it's going to be a long time. And so Orpah, the Bible says, Orpah reached over. Will you kiss her on the cheek? And kissed her. Oh, just kiss her. Just, there you go. Kissed her on the cheek and said, I'm going to stay here in Egypt. But now Ruth, the Bible said, wrap your arm around her arm. The Bible said Ruth clang to her. Clang to her. And sold her. That's where we get that famous scripture. She said, I'm going to go where you go. Your God's going to be my God. Your people's going to be my people. Where you live, I'm going to live. Where you die, I'm going to die. I'm going to hang with you. She was a clinger. Are you with me? Amen. Now, Orpah was a kisser. Now, you need to understand something. When you're going through problems, there'll always be two kind of people in your life. There'll be kissers and there'll be clingers. There'll be, now, you need to realize what you're you. Are you a kisser or a clinger? Now, let me tell you about the kisser. The kisser will run up to you when things are going, oh, I love you, oh, you're great, oh, preacher, you preach so good, oh, I just, oh, you're just, but when things really get tough, them kissers will leave you alone. But I, I say, hey, God, in the predicament that I'm in, I don't need no kissers, I need clingers, can somebody help me? I need somebody that'll stick with me through thick and thin. I need somebody that'll be tighter with me than pantyhose, two sizes too small. Amen. I need somebody that'll be a clinger and hang with me. You know what Jesus Christ is looking for in this day we're living in? There's a lot of kissers. They'll say, oh, Jesus, mm, I love you, Jesus. Mm, it's Sunday morning. Mm, I ain't got a ball game. Mm, we ain't got twirling. Mm, I'm going to kiss you while I can. Mm. But Jesus said, I want somebody that'll hang with me through thick and thin. I'm looking for some clingers. Are you still with me? Amen. Now, this is the point i got to show you. Now, Orpah went back. Now, a lot of people wonder what happened to Orpah. What happened to Orpah? She kissed Naomi and stayed in Egypt. Well, if you get your, your uh, encyclopedias out and study JewishHistory.com and look up Orpah, Orpah became a prostitute, if you will. She became a prostitute. You know what prostitutes do? They kiss and run. Can somebody help me? Amen. Are you with me? Amen. If you're looking for a wife, you don't want a prostitute. She'll just kiss you and run. But she want a clinger. She gave birth to Goliath. Now, now let me just fast forward a little bit. Now, uh, Ruth, who, who became a clinger, she stayed there with Sister Sweetness. And guess what? We're going to find this out in the story. She gave birth to a man named Ovid, who gave birth to a man named Jesse, who gave birth to a man named David, who Jesus is the son of David. She was responsible for getting Jesus here. Can somebody help me? Amen. 
And notice this. She was the grandmother of David. She was the mother of Goliath. David, who was the clinger, was responsible for a wiping out. Not only did David kill Goliath, but here one of his men killed his four brothers. All of her, all of her lineage was wiped out. You see, you can't be a kisser and last. Kissers don't last. But if you hang as being a clinger, the promise God gives clingers will always outlast the promise that the devil gives kissers. Can somebody help me? Amen. So here we go. The kissers left. Go home, home kisser. Amen. And now here is Naomi with Ruth. And they're going back to Bethlehem, Judah. Now let's get to the scriptures. We've got to read the scripture or it ain't preaching. Amen. As she goes back, I just told you the story up to verse 20 of Ruth chapter 1. But now look at verse 20. When Naomi came back to Bethlehem, Judah, this is what she said. People were saying, is that Naomi? Is that Naomi? And this is what she said. Call me not Naomi. Call me Mara. For God has dealt very bitterly with me. Leave that scripture up there for just a moment. There's a lot of teaching to do out of that scripture before we can go on. The very first thing I want to show you is she had it in her heart that she's no longer sweetness. Naomi means sweetness. But Mara means bitter. She said, don't call me sweetness no more. Sweetness no more. Call me bitter. Now, here's the point, Grace Point, that you need to know. And I know you're pastor, so I know I really don't spend, need to spend a whole lot of time on this point. Naomi comes back into town and says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Now, I've read the Bible all the way through from front to back and read the book of Ruth several times, and this is what I find. A lot of times you can find something in the things that you don't find. Amen. Nobody ever called her Mara. They kept calling her sweetness. They kept calling her Naomi. You can't find one reference in the Bible where somebody called her Mara. She was convinced that she was no good, but the people in Bethlehem Judah weren't convinced that she wasn't no good. And what we need in this world we're living in is churches that'll look at Naomi whenever she's coming back and she thinks that she ain't worthy and she thinks that something... Place. And she thinks that she's no longer, she no longer has the name that God called her. And she's made up her mind. I'm a drug addict. I'm just a, a prostitute. I'm just a harlot. I'm a failure. I'm this. We need churches all over the town that'll say, you may think that, but we still gonna call you by the name. That... We still gonna call you sweetness. Amen. So that's where the story gets good. Now, this is where God began to speak to me. Because, okay, God, I've read that. I felt like I was done. I felt like I was over. I felt like I was through. Who would come? I even had members of my church that I pastored, Unity Church of God. I even had members of the church that would come to me and say, I don't want to serve God no more. I said, what do you mean? Well, if God would let your son die, and, you're, and I had a man tell me, he was a leader in our community, he was a member of our church, a great leader in our church. He came to me and sat down with me, and he said, I ain't serving God no more. I said, what do you mean? If God would let your son die, and you're the man that won me to the Lord, what would he do to me? I questioned God on this, and man, I, man, I was just losing people right and left. People that were kissers were leaving, walking out the door, and I'm thinking, God, what am I going to do? How can I, what, how can I get up? From here, whenever Naomi came back to town with Ruth, Naomi, because she thought of herself as being bitter, because she thought of herself as being old and, and no good anymore, she thought her life was done. She comes back and here's Ruth. Ruth is a young, pretty girl. And Naomi tells her, now, you see the welfare system back in those days, it wasn't, it wasn't stay at home, have 12 kids, you'll have another and we'll give you a car. Amen. No, 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 no. The welfare system back in them days was the farmers would leave stuff in the field. And if you got up and went out and picked it up, gleaning in the field, then you could eat. If you didn't, then you died. That's the reason the Bible said a man that don't work, you can't eat. Are you still with me? Amen. And so you just didn't sit at home and watch Bonanza all day and get a check in the mailbox the first of every month. That wasn't the way the welfare system went. Amen. Well, I shouldn't have said Bonanza because most people that watch Bonanza get a job. Can somebody? Ben, ben will teach you to work. Praise God. Amen. Amen. But, but hear me and hear me, hear me close. That wasn't the way. You had to get up. So, so Naomi said, Ruth, you need to go find somebody's field. 
the glean hen because if you don't, we're going to starve to death. And this is where the story gets interesting. The Bible says she just happenly, happenly to fall in the field of Boaz. Oh, my goodness. Are you still with me? Amen. Boaz. She found, she began to glean in the field of Boaz. Now, this is important. Boaz, you mind helping me preach a minute? So Boaz comes along, and she just happens to be picking up picking up stuff in the field of Boaz. And Boaz looks at, at Ruth. Now, I'm just, this is just illustrating here, Mama, or wife, amen. And she, just look, she looks at Ruth and says, my, 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 who is that? And somebody tells Boaz, that's, that's Naomi's daughter-in-law. And Boaz said, wait a minute, I'm kin to her. Now, see, if you couldn't marry a brother, it was up to the next person in line to take care of the widows and the orphans. And, and Boaz said, wait a minute, but I'm not the, in the pecking order. I'm not the one that's going to have to take it. So he went down and talked to the next person that was in charge, are you still with me, of taking care of the family. And that guy said, hey, I got all I can take. You take care of her. That's what he said. You take care of her. So Boaz said, oh, yeah, we got this. Amen. And so she, she started coming every day into the field of Boaz. She started coming every day into the field of Boaz. Now watch this and watch it real, real, real close. Because when Boaz got to seeing her coming, now, again, the, the people that, that how the welfare worked, was you came and picked the crop after they picked the crop and whatever was left, you got whatever they didn't pick. Or if you ever rode by a South Georgia cotton field, after they picked it, you see a lot of cotton still out there. That's what the poor people got. Or, or you ever walk behind a corn picker. I, I, I farm a little bit. If you ever walk behind a corn picker, there'll always be some corn left on the ground. And, and that's what the poor people got. And that, that's a, the stuff that was just dropped by accident, the stuff that the picker didn't get, the stuff that, are, are you still with me? Amen. But Boaz, whenever he saw Ruth and figured out who she was, look what happened. And look in, look, look in Ruth chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. Watch this. When she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and don't you say nothing to her. Reproach her not. Verse 16. Now this is the whole thing. And let fall also some handfuls on purpose, and leave them, that she may glean them and rebuke her not. What, look what Boaz said. Boaz told his servants, now I want y'all to go pick my corn today, but I want you to drop some bundles on purpose in front of her. I don't want her to have to root around like some beggar. I want her to find some handfuls, amen, that I've left for her on purpose so that she will leave bountifully, amen. And then when Ruth comes back to Naomi and said, look what all I got today. And she said, well, whose field you been picking in? He said, well, I just happened by coincidence being Boaz. Ruth said, uh-oh, you dress up pretty. You make yourself look good because you ain't going to have to wear your work clothes very long. Amen. You start looking good because I know who Boaz is. And Boaz, how many of you like girls that are that? Let me tell you girls something that ain't married. Always look for you a Boaz. But watch this. Boaz said, I want to drop some handful, and she comes back with all this bountiful bunch of stuff, and that sparked something in her eye. Man, that convinced Mara, Naomi, not to call herself Mara no more. When she saw the handfuls on purpose coming in through Ruth, oh my God, it changed how she felt about the whole situation, and it changed how she felt about her. To the point, I'm going to go ahead and finish up this point, then get back to the point I want to preach. To the point, now watch this. Whenever Naomi, you read your Bible, Naomi hooked up with Boaz. She hooked up with Boaz. Boaz loved him some, not Naomi, loved him some Ruth. Boaz loved him some Ruth. And so the Bible said they got married and they had a baby. His name was Obed. Obed. Now you've got to see this. Naomi, when she came back, she said, I'm old. I'm old. I'm old. Just sit down here with me, old. I'm old. Just call me Mara. I'm bitter. Ruth, ain't no need to come back with me. I ain't never going to have no. I'll never be fruitful again. I'll never be able to make it. You just stay here. I'm going to go back to Bethlehem, Judah. Maybe somebody will give me a little welfare and I can live till I die. That was her mentality. But now because of those handfuls on purpose, she's perked up. And not only has Ruth hooked up with Boaz, but they've had a baby. Whoa! They've had a baby. 
and named him Obed. Now, now you've got to see this. Ruth 4, verse 16. Look at this. Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom and started nursing it. I got a, a, a series back there called, called Beyond the Grave that I put together about death. Let me tell you why I've done it. Because whenever Travis died, I found out the church are stupid. The church people are stupid when it comes to Bible stuff. We quit having, we quit having Bible studies and stuff, and people quit reading their Bibles, and they, they don't know. I had people that were supposed to know better. They would come up to me and say the stupidest things. They'd come up to me and say something like this. God needed an angel in his choir, so he took your son. Really? One lady came up to me and says, God needed another rose. In his garden. I looked at her and said, well, maybe he'll need a sack of manure tomorrow and you'll die. Amen. Because them roses need fertilizing. Can somebody help me? Amen. I mean, why are we killing people? I mean, if God's going to kill people to make heaven look good, well, hey, we're going to need some fertilizer. And what you told me ain't nothing to crap. Can somebody help me? And so I come back and put together a series called Beyond the Grave to teach people what happens at death. But here I was blaming God. Here I was not sure. God even knew my name. But that was Friday. Sunday's coming. Sunday morning was a viewing of my son at the church that afternoon. And so here I am Sunday morning. I don't miss church. I don't miss church. I've been saved 25 years. I've missed two Sundays in 25 years. One, I worked at a nuclear plant, and, and the guy was trying to win. When I walked in that morning, he looked at me and said, Yeah, I thought the God you've been telling me about wasn't as good as the God of money. I knew you'd be here working. And I went to my boss man and said, I can't work Sundays no more. And I didn't, never worked another Sunday at the nuclear plant. And another time, I was pastoring in a lot of building programs, and my heart swelled up, and, and they had to do a heart cath on me. And they run that heart cath in my heart, and it got Sunday morning. I got up and said, I'm going to church. And that doctor said, If you move, you're going to die. I said, I'm going to lay here and watch it on television. Amen. Praise God. I believe in going to church, but hear me. This first Sunday, I got an aunt. An aunt. She's not really an aunt. She's a cousin, but she's mama's first cousin. She's older, so we call, in South Georgia, you call old cousins aunt. Y'all do that too, I guess. Amen, redneck. Amen. But here she is, Aunt Jeanette. Aunt Jeanette. She's got a sister named Von Seal. Aunt Jeanette comes to me. And she's, she's a precious Baptist sister. Baptist, oh, God loves God, but don't believe in the moving of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me back up a little bit closer, a little bit further. Thursday, my son got killed that night. That Thursday morning was a big hunt. I am a hunter. Down on the wildlife management area right outside of Jessup. And me and my son always went on that hunt, but he had to go back to college that day after fall break. And so I text him. I'm up in his tree stand, and I'm texting him, and I said, man, I love you. So I'm so proud of you. And then I text three words that I never even say. It's just a little slogan. I said, well, he's going back to be president of student body. He's going back 4.0 average. He's got the Dean's Award. They're writing all articles about him. I text him. I said, go get him. Go get him. Nobody knew about that text but me and Travis. Nobody knew about that text but me and Travis. Now, here it is Sunday morning, and I'm getting ready to go to the viewing of my boy. And here Aunt Jeanette is. She's not spirit-filled, but, but she loves God so much, and she walks up to me, and, and I'm getting ready, and I, I hadn't eaten, I hadn't slept. I'm, God, my boy, I'm about to go, oh, my God. And, and she looks at me, and this is what she says. She said, little George, that's what they used to call him, little George. Little George, I got something I need to tell you, son. And, and I just kind of, yes, ma'am, respecting, but yes, ma'am. I didn't want to hear another rose in the garden. I didn't want to hear another angel in the choir. I didn't want to hear none of that mess. But out of respect for her, because I was raised by one of them mamas that'll pop you in the mouth if you disrespect your elders. Amen. And my mama was there and I didn't want to get popped. She didn't make you hold a soapy rag in your mouth if you didn't say things just right for an hour. Amen. If soapy rag will keep, that's leading my teeth. They're so pearly white. Amen. Praise God. But, but, but hear me. Out of respect to Angel Ned, I just, yes ma'am. And I kind of looked down. Yes ma'am. She said, no son, I got to tell you something. I, yes ma'am. I, I wouldn't even make eye contact with her. And stand up, dude. And she, she, when I did, she, she grabbed me by both cheeks. She said, grab me by both cheeks. She said, no, son, listen to me. She said, this ain't never happened to me before. This ain't never happened. And she's shaking her the power of God. And, 
And, and she looks dead in my eyes. She said, I got something I need to tell you. I'm thinking, okay, Anjanette, just tell me. And she said, God told me to come to you today and tell you that if Travis was here, he would have three words for you. What is that, Aunt Jeanette? He would say, go get them. The last text that I sent him. Nobody knew about that text. But me and Travis. You know what that was? It was a handful. Uh-oh. If God is able to tell her what Travis would say, then Travis made it. Travis had to make it. The devil wouldn't have sent her up here to tell me that. So that was a handful on purpose. That, that afternoon we went to the church. Our sanctuary set 1,400 people. 4,500 people showed up for Travis's viewing. 4,500. They were like, they said that was the largest gathering of people ever in the history of my county. I looked up and I seen state senators. I looked up and I seen and I seen representatives. I seen all kind of preachers from all over the country were standing in line. And each one of them would pour into me. You know what they were doing? Oh, God was just using them to drop a handful on purpose. The next Sunday, it's time to go to church. I looked at Debbie and said, where are we going to go to church at? This is the first Sunday now since Travis has been in the grave. Where, where are we going to go to church at? And, and, and my brother, my brother had got us all a condo, and my whole family, my extended family, down at St. Simon's Island. And there's a church on St. Simon's Island called Christian Life, I think, Christian Community Church. It runs about 1,000 people. It's independent. So, but they don't know me. I don't know them. I'm Church of God. They don't know me. So let's go down there. Let's go down there. That's where we'll go to church at. I need to hear a word from God. So we go to church and we sit on the back row. We get there kind of late and we walk in and sit on the back row and, and nobody knows us. We don't know nobody. I tell Debbie, me, me and her pray before we leave church, leave the condo. I need to hear a word from God. The first thing that happens, we get up there, Brother Chris, the pastor gets up and says, or the, the man in charge of service, our pastor's not here today. He's on vacation. And we got a professor from the college. He's going to teach us about evolution. You know what I done? I went, Eight. <laughs> Y'all get that later. Amen. Praise God. I don't need, I know I didn't come from a monkey. I don't need nobody teaching me that. I need a word from God. But the music minister, like our brother here, was ministering from behind the piano. The only difference was he was standing up. And they sang some good songs like y'all did here. And man, that was just songs we sang. And so I just fit right in. And then all of a sudden he stopped while he was playing. He stopped. And he said, there's somebody here. Remember, I wasn't never going to tell the story again. Two reasons. God don't keep his promise. Another reason, God, I could never, I could never go and stand beside some young person's bed. when they, I could never do that. I don't think, I don't think you require that of me. So I ain't going to preach no more. I can't preach again. I'll never preach another time. And this guy stops and said, there's somebody here who's made up your mind. You're not going to tell the story anymore. My wife bumped me in the side and she said, George? I said, Debbie, nobody wants to tell the story anymore. There's a thousand people here. This cat don't know me. And then he goes on, he's strumming on the piano just like our brother is. He's strumming on the piano and he says this. He said, sir, you've made up your mind that you're not going to tell the story anymore. Well, now he's narrowed it down to 40% because 60% of the people who come to church are women. Only 40% are men. So now he's got it down to, well, he's, he's 60, 40% chance here. He's right. He's talking to me. But then something happened. He started strumming on the piano song, and this is what he said. He said, me and Travis was walking down the road yesterday. His boy's name was Travis. He said, me and, me and Travis was walking down the road yesterday. And, and, and Travis looked at me and said, Daddy, there's somebody that's going to be there tomorrow that's ready to give up on telling this story. And Daddy, I want to request a song for that man. I want to request blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. And this is what the man said. He stopped and he said, Sir, wherever you're at, 
at the request of Travis, I dedicate this song to you. Wow. Wow. Next Sunday comes along. Next Sunday comes along. Well, between that Sunday and the next Sunday, I'm fighting battles like I ain't never fought. I'm out on the bulldozer on our farm and I'm clearing some shooting lanes for deer and, and, I, and, and, and it's just a spirit came all over me that, that Travis don't know everything he's going through. And I, I was convinced that I needed to go be with Travis. I even stopped the bulldozer, walked up to the house we were standing with my brothers and I walked up to my brother's house and told Debbie, hugged her and says, I got to go be with Travis. I'm going to end my life today. I, I, you stay here with Casey. I'm going to go with Travis and everything will be all right and everything will work out. And so I go back and get on the bulldozer. My plan is, I done kissed her goodbye. Everything is right. My plan is to get on the bulldozer, aim it at a big tree, step on the track. It'll run over me and it'll stall at the tree and people will think I had an accident and they'll bring Debbie chicken and dumplings and everything will be great and I'll be with Travis and Debbie will be with Casey. So I got the bulldozer going and I stand up and I've got my foot on the track so close that the track is hitting the bottom of my boot. And the Lord speaks to me. And this is what the Lord says. He says, the only thing worse than you being on earth and Travis being in heaven is you being in hell and Travis being in heaven because if you can't trust me to live, don't you trust me to die. When he said that, I stopped the bulldozer, got off and started praying and when I started praying, my phone rang. My phone rang. And it was Steve Brock. I don't know if y'all know Steve Brock. You see him on TVN all the time. But it was Steve Brock. And Steve said, George, what just happened? I said, what do you mean? He said, two hours ago, God made me stop my production and go to my closet and pray for you. And it wasn't just five minutes ago he told me everything's all right. I want to know what happened. You know what Steve was, you know what God was doing with Steve? Dropping a handful. It saved my life. Drop the handful on purpose. Next Sunday comes around. Where are we going to go to church at, Debbie? There's a man. It was the first day of deer season. That's the day that me and Travis would always spend together. I accidentally, not accidentally, I took one of the pills the doctor gave me because I couldn't sleep that night. And it made me, when I did go to sleep, I slept too long. And so I took those pills and flushed them down the toilet because I, I, I built two drug rehabs for people with those kind of problems, so I didn't want to get on that. And so, so we overslept. And, but that night we talked, where are we going to go to church? I'm hurrying. Where are we going to go to church? And I told her, I said, Stephen Toole, man that pastors Cedar Cross in Church of God, God just spoke to me and said, he's got a word for us. Let's go to Cedar Cross. It's about an hour, 10 minutes away. Well, the next morning I oversleep, Chris. I oversleep and we get up late. And so we're hurrying, rushing. We jump in the car and take off to Cedar Cross in it. We get to Baxley, Georgia. If you're familiar with South Georgia. Baxley, Georgia, which is 30 minutes from my house, still 40 minutes from Cedar Crossing. And it's 11 o'clock. I look at Debbie and say, uh, I hate to go this late. Let's forget about Cedar Crossing. I must have been wrong. God ain't got, maybe, let's stop at Baxley Church of God. And we'll just go to church there. So we stop and go into Baxley Church of God when we walk in on the door. Service started at 1030. I went, ah, we're 30 minutes late anyway. So we get in. They've done, done the praise and worship in there. The preacher's about to preach, and so I'm waiting on him to pray. So the preacher prays. I open the door. Stephen Toole is the guest speaker at Baxley Church of God that day. And he preaches a message on 1 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise he's preaching out of a little red bible and he looks back at me when he gets through preaching he starts weeping and he said God told me to preach out of this bible because this is the bible they gave me when my brother got killed this has all the notes of this message in it and God told me to preach it here today and then drive to Jessup and give it to that man back there and he walked back there and handed me this bible and, and then he done something because I said I'd never hold one of these again it made me sleep late so that I could find a handful of handful on purpose the next Sunday and I'm I'm hurriedly the next Sunday somebody Bobby Moore had come and give us some money he says I want you to go on a trip just go somewhere and stay and so me and Debbie thought let's go to the Biltmore mansion in Carolinas and while we're down there we'll just go over to Loran Livingston's church he pastors 5,000 people let's go to hear him so we went that morning and, and, and we get there we get there right time but his church is packed 
He preaches three times on Sunday morning. His sanctuary hold about 2,000, and it's packed. So the ushers lead us down and set us about third row from the front. Well, I don't want nobody to know I'm a preacher. I don't want nobody to know nothing. I'm just here to hear the word. And Loran gets up and preaches, and this is what he says. He says, God's changed the message from the first two services this morning. He told me to preach something different on this service. So here's the message I'm going to preach this morning. Here's the title. Where your loved ones go when they die and how you ought to act until you see them again. And he preached a powerful message. Well, there was a lady when he said, get up and greet. I greeted the lady in front of me. She had a badge on said, elder's wife. She was an elder's wife. And, and I shook her hand and she introduced herself. And at the end of the service, I took a tie envelope and wrote a little note to Lorraine. And I told her, I said, listen, we lost our son. And that was powerful. Will you get this note to Lorraine? And she looked at me and she said, my husband happens to be his driver today. He'll get the note. We go eat lunch and decided we'd come back that night to church. And so we come back that night and Loran's out in the hallway and I walk up to him and I said, Brother Loran, you don't know me. He said, you're George. I got that note from you. I said, yeah. He said, wow, thank you. I said, I, I'm going to be praying for you. We're good. So we get in. There's 2,000 people there on Sunday night service. We go in and the service is going, the worship is going, and Loran raises his hand and stops the service. And he walks up to the pulpit and he's crying. And this is what he said. He said, church, the only reason God has got Central Church of God meeting today is for one reason. It ain't to sing songs. It ain't to take up an offering. It ain't for me to preach. There's only one reason he's got us here, and God just spoke to me. And the only reason he's got us here is to pray for a couple. George and Debbie Moxie, will y'all come down here? Uh-oh. 2,000 people, and you're stopping the service just to pray for me? I look at my watch. It's 630. The service only been going 30 minutes. So he gets us down there, and, and he says, I want every couple here that's lost a child to come pray for this couple. 35 couples come down and pray for us. You know what that was? But listen, that ain't all. We leave. He, when we get, they get through praying for us. This is what he says. He said, that's the only reason we were here. Y'all go home. And dismisses the service. Wow. <laughs> wow. So we go down to P.F. Chains to eat. That was Travis's favorite restaurant. We just felt like we needed to go there. So we went down. And we were sitting there eating. And my phone rings. It's my state representative, Mark Williams. Not the general overseer. My, my state representative. He's now the DNR chairman of, uh, uh, of the old state of Georgia, but he's calling me and he's crying. George, me and him's real good friends. George, I know you, you're not preaching. I know you're off. He said, but Mary Caitlin, that's his daughter. Mary Caitlin, she was the head major at the University of Georgia. Mary Caitlin was on her way back to school. And she's been in a terrible accident. They got her in Athens. She's on life support. I can't get to her as quick as you can. He's weeping. Please, my friend, get to my daughter. Oh, no, I can't. Myself, my mind. I can't. I can't go stand beside the bed of somebody dying. Not yet. It's only been four weeks. I can't. I can't. But naturally, that's what my inner being, but my flesh, I'll be there, buddy, and I hung up and we tear out. We get there to Athens. I stand by her bed all night long. I stay with her all night long. Finally, she comes to. They take the tubes and all out of her. They're trying to get her to respond. And they leaned over to her and says, What's your name? She said, Mary Caitlin, when's your birthday? That, what, what time did the accident happen? She said, 6.30 on the dot. At the exact time Loran stopped the service to ask me to come down and pray was the time. You know what God was doing? Dropping handfuls on purpose. Now, the next Sunday, Paul Walker came from Cleveland, Tennessee. Actually came from Russia. Spend the weekend with me. And he had lost his son to a drunk driver years ago. He pastored the largest Pentecostal church in the, in the world at one time. Mount Perrin in Atlanta. And the next Sunday, I got up and started preaching. And I've been preaching ever since. Here's the point. I wouldn't have if God hadn't have done like he did Naomi and Boaz who represents Jesus Christ hadn't have told his servants who represents Loren Livingston Stephen Toole the guy down at 
the church on St. Simon's, if those servants hadn't have been willing to take the handfuls that God was telling them to drop from me, they didn't even know who they were dropping it for. If that hadn't have happened, I wouldn't be here today. I would be dead. David would be married to some rich man, spending all my insurance money and shooting my guns. But hear me and hear me close. God took Naomi's story and showed me what he was going to do for me. How are you going to end this? Very simple. Very simple. There's somebody here today that needs a handful on purpose. It might be joy. It might be peace. It might be understanding. It, 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 it might be just, 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 let me know you're there, God. It could be a million things. Funny thing about, I always like to use a tissue box because every time God drops a handful on purpose, he's still got one. You just ain't no way to wear it out. God says, I got a handful on purpose for you. And then the flip side of that coin is this. Thank God he used people. I could tell that story. I'm writing a book called, called Lord of the Cave is the title of my book. I'm, I'm hoping to have it out by in two months. But I, time, time would prevent me from talking about all the cards and messages. And the Tomlins are here. They sent me a card. And not only sent me a card, but had... I'm, I, they don't want me to tell this and, and I, they might not even remember it they had a hundred dollar gift in there for me just to say I love you didn't, didn't, didn't tell me my son was a rose didn't tell me my son was an angel just sent me a card with a gift in it and I love you you know what that was it's just a handful on purpose so here's, here's the deal you may be here today and say I need a handful I purposely I purposely drop these all over this front for you to come down and pick one up and let it represent let it represent what God wants to drop for you today but secondly listen to this they would be no handfuls if God didn't let, it, let those handfuls drop from heaven Boaz didn't say let's go out and pray maybe a tree or bird will come by and drop a seed no he deliberately sent his servants out to drop handfuls on purpose God specifically specifically wants you to drop a handful for somebody on purpose. That's the second part of this altar call because this man, I know his heart, I know his burden, I know his vision. And you know what he needs? He needs a church full of people just like you that are willing to take a handful and just drop it in front of somebody that's in need. Wow. Handful on purpose. Father, Brother Chris has had and will have greater preachers than what he's got here today. But Lord, there's no doubt in my mind that your timing ain't right for what I've said this morning. As I look across this congregation, God, and I see not only, not only tears, not only brokenness, I see eagerness. God, these folks have acted like a sponge today, just sopping up everything that you would say through your word. God, I guarantee you, Lord, the congregation this size, there's some kissers here that will just move on good message and then walk away. But God, there's some clingers here. There's some clingers here that you can drop handfuls on purpose in front of. Ruth, Ruth was responsible for giving us Jesus. It was G the greatest handful on purpose ever dropped was Jesus Christ. Now Ruth came and picked up a handful, but she was responsible for dropping the biggest handful. Oh my God. So Father, help us today to be willing vessels, willing servants to not only pick up the handful we need, but be willing to drop the handful for somebody else. Now, Father, I'm about to give this altar call, and, and God, I've done everything I can do. Everything else is totally up to you. So, Father, I'm asking you to speak to our hearts today. 
in the name of Jesus.